Let's bring in our think tank tonight. Joining us, family law attorney and law professor Randy Kessler, criminal defense attorney Josh Teague, and trial attorney Marie Napoli. Great to have you all here. I kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, gave out your names backwards, but that's, let me see, who's over here? That's Randy <laughs> down there, that's Josh there, and that's Marie over there. All right, got you all. All right, um, Marie, let me start with you. What do, what do you think it means, the fact that two-thirds of the defense team is gone now. This is a high-profile case. Usually, criminal defense attorneys don't mind being involved in a high-profile case, yet two have taken themselves out of this. I think that that's absolutely crazy. It's not often that you see attorneys removing themselves from a case, and that's uh, usually a sign that there's some uh, reason why they can no longer represent this client um, fully, whether they have information that would cause them not to be able to make misrepresentations to the court because an attorney cannot put any false representations in front of a court um, or there could have been just some kind of differences in the way that they wanted to proceed but that on top of having the judge removed uh, which is also uh, as a new york lawyer a little bit bizarre it's not so easy easy to have a judge removed in a case otherwise um, uh, attorneys would be making motions left and right, whoever was losing, and they felt that they were losing in front of that judge would move to have them relieved. So um, really uh, interesting trial, to say the least. Yeah, you know, Josh, they have this special rule in uh, Idaho, as they have in some other jurisdictions as well, that you can bounce, you get to bounce one judge off of your case. You get one strike. It's like eliminating a juror. Uh, so, Josh, do you think that was just um, them looking to spin the uh, bail wheel one more time to see if they could perhaps get a lower bail than $1 million? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think they looked at it as, what do we have to lose here? Uh, I don't think they saw themselves ending up in a worse position than with this judge. Uh, they had history with this judge already, and I think they knew they were either going to produce the children or, or have to pay a million-dollar bond. And uh, I, I don't think they were going to do either one of those. So they just, as you said, sp spun the wheel to see, see what they get next. Randy Kessler, let me talk about the lawyers one more time. Uh, you and I spent a lot of time talking about uh, Casey Anthony years ago. Casey Anthony's attorney was known by no one before the trial. Afterwards, he's uh -huh. probably one of the five most recognizable attorneys in the nation. Uh, this case uh, has been described by J.J.'s own grandfather, missing J.J., as bigger than the Casey Anthony case. I mean, there's, there's more missing people. There's more dead bodies. Um, are you shocked? that two of these attorneys have said, no thanks. No, I'm not. I mean, that's what good lawyers do. Good lawyers don't take a case just because of the fame, just because of the prestige. Look, lawyers have to make a living. If, if the clients can't pay them and they've got other clients that can pay them, you know, what if someone came into my office and said, I'll pay you whatever it takes. I want you to represent me. And I say, no, I want to represent this famous case for free. I mean, it's not fair to the client that can pay me. It's not fair to my family. There are a lot of reasons lawyers won't take a case or will step down from a case. But sometimes it's just because the witness or the client won't take the lawyer's advice. I might say, I don't want to call this person on your defense or as a witness. And the client may say, I'm in charge. It's my case. I want you to handle it this way. And I might say, we've got a difference of opinion. I'd rather not be involved than handle the case the way the client wants me to handle the case. Uh, uh, Josh, is it, is it, how difficult is it for attorneys to see a case like this the same way? Like, if you've got three attorneys, like, if I put you three... Uh, you know, to defend me in court. I mean, do you think the three of you could agree on how to defend me? I mean, it's, to me, that seems like that could be a challenge in and of itself. Well, you know, that can be difficult, especially if, if the client is hiring three random attorneys. They're calling it three people that they found on Google or that they got referred to. You know, typically when we work with other attorneys, um, they're people that we've, we've recommended or we've chosen to work with. You know, if a client comes to us with a really big case, there's a case out of our circuit. Maybe we call somebody that we know that we're friends with um, that has a better pulse on that circuit or with a certain judge or that we think may, uh, you know, may, may appeal to a certain demographic in, in a trial. Uh, you know, those are general relationships that we have beforehand. And, uh, and it's, it's not that difficult when you have that established relationship. I have worked on cases where I, I've got brought in to help somebody I didn't know or somebody's came in and helped me that I didn't know. And, um, you're, you're really having to, to fill each other out and kind of establish the boundaries as who's going to do what and who's going to make what decisions uh, because 
you know, everybody can't be making the same decisions. It won't work. Marie, I look at this case and, and, and you know, we talk about the investigators from Arizona, investigators from Hawaii, uh, investigators from Idaho, all involved. The FBI is involved. So you've got a huge team piecing together, trying to figure out, first of all, where these two kids are, also trying to figure out, you know, how did Lori Vallow's brother die? Uh, what, were, what were the true circumstances surrounding the shooting death of her husband? What are the circumstances of the death of Chad Daybell's wife? I mean, all these investigators working on that, and now you've got one lawyer for Lori Vallow? Is, is that lawyer? He may be the best lawyer in Rexburg, Idaho, but is there a chance he could be overmatched in this one? Uh, well, that's always a possibility. I, if I was her lawyer, I would be looking for a co-counsel that would uh, complement my my services. I'm sure that uh, the attorneys who left the case uh, were doing different jobs in the trial than he was doing himself. So I'm sure he has a support team, um, and maybe he'll try it himself. That that would be fine, but uh, he definitely needs support. And there's a lot more uh, when you're at trial than just the attorney standing up before the, before the judge. You have a whole team of lawyers go, reading through documents, um, preparing exhibits for you, helping you with the openings. Um, it's really just, even though his name's on it, I'm sure he's not the only one. You know, Randy, um, the one thing that we often hear from the defense bar is that, you know, investigators, you got the FBI, you've got state investigators, everything. They have bottomless resources. But at the end of the day, doesn't the criminal defendant, just in their little brain between their ears, actually know the truth? Isn't that an incredible advantage that the defense has, that they have access to the defendant's brain? 100%, if their client is telling them the truth. And, you know, when you talk about all these lawyers combining, the nice thing in the Casey Anthony case and the O.J. Simpson case, when you have really good lawyers, they put their egos aside. They see, they listen. And, you know, you, you can't really learn much when you're talking. So when they sit around and they listen, you might hear something that you never thought of. And, and it's actually sort of a, a, a thrill to, to represent somebody with another lawyer that I, re, that I respect because I might learn something or I might realize what I'm doing is wrong and I need to change my ways. So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a super advantage if you have a cooperative witness, a cooperative defendant who will tell you the truth and will point you in the right direction. And sometimes they're, they're smarter than some of the lawyers in the case. Yeah. Randy, you know, you are a great friend of mine. I, I respect your, your intellect and everything else, but you know, uh -oh. I cannot uh -oh. let it go uh -oh. by when you say <laughs> anything that, it, that a nice thing happened in the OJ or Casey Anthony case, because everybody watching here knows how those two turned out and it was not nice in our search for the but truth. The just my opinion. Just my opinion. You're entitled. Okay, thank you. Can I, can I add to that? Sure. Can I just add to that? I, I do a lot of uh, civil rights cases, um, uh, getting people out of jail that have served 10, 20, 30 years for crimes that they haven't commit, committed. And I see it all too often, uh, innocent people uh, getting locked up and guilty people going free. So. It really isn't always about uh, the truth of the matter. So um, I agree, you know, uh, we, 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 there are problems in our judicial system, but it's the best we have. Oh, it absolutely is the best we have, the best in the world. Uh, doesn't always work out exactly right. And it's, and, it's, and it's much worse when the innocents are convicted. Much, much worse. All right, when we come back.